Greetings and welcome to Drawings of Dragons. I'm your host, Miguel Lawler. Many adventurers claim to have come face to face with the Green Dragon, some even pretending they know everything about them. But what if I told you that most of what circulates about this grim monstrosity is just hearsay, second or even third hand information? I, in stark contrast, have had the privilege of witnessing this creature's first hand. So, if you're eager to learn all there is to know about this foul smelling dragon, come with me. The individual who set me on the trail of the green dragon is no other than my flamboyant friend, Urel Daggerforte. Having just escaped from the underground court of the Goblin King Fistil III, I found refuge in Urel's company. After the tragic events at the Goblin Cabaret, my friend had taken under his wing the fabulous Daughters of Nanana. Together they had staged a new and revolutionary show, The Wondrous Wars Encounters, drawing nightly crowds eager to witness the breathtaking performance of the Daughters of Nanana in their acrobatic battles. Reuniting with my dear friends, has been a blessing after so much suffering. But even though they asked nothing of me in exchange for their kindness, the truth is that being penniless bothered me a lot. Understanding my dark circumstances, Ural decided to introduce me to one of his closest companions, a certain Lyokin, a renowned knight if one were to believe my friend's embellishments. This Lyokin wanted to be immortalized in a portrait. Urel, in his usual fashion, praised my artistic talents and my former tenure as a painter in the royal court, conveniently omitting the fact that he was under a goblin king. In the evening, I found myself in the presence of this enigmatic knight. I must confess, I was not prepared for the encounter. Nestled in the darkness of the room's farthest corner sat a colossus, towering well over seven feet, with shoulders broad as the horizon. He was dressed entirely in shadows. His face remained veiled beneath the cloak's depths, revealing only the glimmer of malevolent eyes and a perpetually sarcastic grin. While the typical gentleman might bear a dagger or a slender sword, Lyokin bore a giant blade, almost my height, and a sinister hammer, the raven's beak or crow's beak. I had never encountered a person before who inspired in me such a strong urge to seek refuge. Every aspect of him scared me. He exuded the stench of warfare, the thang of bloodshed and the aura of anguish. Yorel whispered to me, He's no as the war raven, best not ruffle his feathers. Yet, one should not hastily judge a book by its cover, for despite his dreadful appearance, the Dark Knight possessed a silver tongue that could enchant even the most discerning of artists. Twenty thousand gold pieces for my portrait, perhaps more, proclaimed the Dark Knight. T -t -t Twenty thousand gold pieces? An extravagant vision unfolded. A life of contemplation, tranquility, painting countryside landscapes. Or perhaps I'd marry all the non 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 girls simultaneously sailing on a luxurious barge drifting along calm rivers for the remainder of my days. Suddenly, the war raven morphed into a less menacing individual. The sparkle in his eyes resembled the gleam of pure diamonds, his everlasting smile now cheerful and amusing. I proposed to start the portrait immediately. However, he replied that the northern scenery did not align with his vision. If I consented, I should accompany him on a small excursion to the south, 
with all expenses covered. Here I was, engaging in conversation with a genuine connoisseur of the arts. Behind the intimidating appearance of a villainous warrior, a sensitive heart and a wise, generous patron lay hidden. If it necessitated extravagant travel to find the perfect landscape for his portrait, then so be it. Only the finest would be enough for those who comprehend the true meaning of art. With sincere emotion, I enthusiastically shook his hand. Sir Lyakin then handed me a map, with instructions to meet him in three days at the base of a distinguished oak tree, marking the beginning of the main road leading to the warm southern lands. In the meantime, here's enough to cover your expenses, he said, tossing me a general's field pouch. Inside, I found ten gold coins. Having only dealt with common tarnished copper coins, the feel of such noble metal sent me into a golden dream. Today, everything is on my account, my patron added. Feast on all the meat you desire. Soon, crayfish, crabs and large shrimp will be your only meals. Ah, oh, the sea! An escapade along a riviera awaited me. My career was sure to take a splendid turn. Lyokin, the patron of fine arts, bid farewell to our company, and I spent an enchanting evening contemplating my newfound life. Gold, my friends, is a fog that gently blinds you. Alas, I confess to expending my gold coins with surprising speed. The lifestyle of a celebrated artist is a costly affair, with pigments boasting precious powders and brushes adorned with silky hairs from rare animals commanding exorbitant prices. Yet, I convinced myself that only the finest materials were fitting for my lord, Lyokin. Still, I had one small detail to settle, the matter of my steed, Cyclop, that cursed one eye donkey from a desperate transaction a few years ago, and I was already dreaming of the moment when I would sell him to the glue factory, as soon as I finished the portrait of the noble Lyokin. Then, three days later, I found myself under the giant oak, the starting point of our journey. Before me sprawled an immense valley, blanketed by a forest so dense it resembled an endless emerald tapestry. With no sight of my patron, I established a small camp for the night. A beautiful evening descended upon me, followed by a gentle night. My pipe, my favorite tobacco, smoke rings in a starry night, that my friend is the closest to heaven a man can expect to hear below. The next day, as morning approached its end, the unmistakable sound of a horse drawing near caught my attention, and there my benefactor finally made his arrival. I must concede that at the sight of him, the impulse to flee and hide myself even more than during our initial encounter surged within me. This time, his presence was downright astonishing. For Lyokin rode the most massive stallion I had ever seen, a monster named Furioso. Together they formed a colossal centaur cloaked in black. However, my heart nearly ceased its beating as my gaze settled upon the knight's head. Lyokin sported only a peculiar round hat, leaving his face exposed. It was a horrifying sight. A ghoulish figure emerged. The source of his eternal smile became painfully apparent. The man lacked lips, the right side of his mouth exposing the bone of his jaw. 
instead of a nose, there were now two dark holes that resembled the lifeless of the deceased. The notion that I had been ensnared by a demon seized me and I waited the earth to cleave open and swallow me whole. As if sensing my apprehension, the Black Knight spoke in a mocking tone. Do not be alarmed, Master Artus, for I shall not feast upon you. That I promised. If my legs were under my control, I might have fled to my old mother's house on the other side of the world. Lyokin dismounted from his steed, delivering a few friendly taps on my shoulders, as if to snap me out of my trance. It's all right. The disgust my face provokes is no stranger to me, and it serves me more than it harms me. N -n no sir y your face doesn't disgust me at all, I managed to say. The great knight laughed hurriedly. Don't be afraid, I won't ask you to draw this face. These words added only confusion to my fear. Yet, I remained silent. Lycan tried to put me at easy. Worry not, Master Artist, for there waits a reward of 20,000 gold pieces. Perhaps more. Reassuring words indeed. The poor man was only bearing the scars of his countless battles. Surely fighting to save themselves in distress, protect the weak and defend the poor. A kind of occupational hazard. I began to feel a certain pity for such a noble knight, ready to sacrifice himself if a just cause demanded. Another thing that struck me was the rather worn condition of his chin mail and the apparently poverty of his clothes, tattered and patched in places. This did not match a knight of such high rank, lord of fields and castles. What modesty! I thought, full of admiration. After camping beneath the great oak for another night, we broke camp the following morning. Descending into the valley, soon we found ourselves surrounded by the immense forest. For a full month, we ventured deeper into this emerald labyrinth, for the forest had gradually turned into a marshland and then from marshland into stifling mangroves. Mosquito swarms attacked relentlessly. More than once I found myself on the ground or in the water, after cycling that treacherous four-legged betrayer kicked to avoid the numerous snakes that continually cross our path. One day, gazing through the jungle canopy, I saw, between the low clouds, a huge serpent-shaped bird. I quickly alerted Lycan, who seemed not at all alarmed by his fleeting sight. It's nothing, Master Artist. A green dragon, nothing more. His voice remained so composed as if he had merely spotted a tiny sparrow. And I didn't think about it anymore for my daily life in this interminable South March consumed all my energy. Our provisions were running out, and so was my endurance. Sensing my physical and moral fatigue, my peculiar patron promised me a seafood dinner. I envisioned the Riviera drawing near, along with the castle perched on cliffs overlooking an idyllic bay, where rest and well-deserved delights awaited us. But as night fell, we lit the fire for the camp, still in the middle of this cursed mangrove. When Lycan cast a net into the black and stagnant water of a pond and from there pulled out some strange crustaceans covered in mud, I began to doubt the plausibility of my expectations. Aha! cried the towering warrior. Tonight we dine on crabs and shrimps, as I promised you. After enduring this marsh diet for more than a week, wandering through this maze, one day we arrived before immense ruins. A 
a city swallowed by the jungle over time immemorial, mysterious and menacing. My employer announced that we had reached our destination, where his portrait should be painted. I couldn't hide my disappointment. Here? Now? I said, unpacking my belongings. No, not now. Come with me, master painter, retorted Lyakin, ascending the stairs on his immense black steed. My steed, that brainless beast, did not show the same enthusiasm to enter this gloomy city in ruins. Damn lousy animal that only brought me shame! Once within the forsaken city's boundaries, we discover a vast square, surrounded by several passages and colonnades. Yet, the encroaching tree roots had disrupted everything as if a slow earthquake sought to dismantle the city inch by inch. A peculiar nauseating smell permeated the air. Lyukin unloaded his horse of all the bags containing his travel belongings and handed me his sword in his raven's beak. Why? I replied. The time's coming, said the knight. You must be ready to hand me the weapons when I ask you. I was about to confess my lack of experience in the arts of war when the nauseating smell grew more intense and a long, deep growl seized our attention. And there, on the far side of the square, a creature emerged, sending a nice shiver coursing through my veins. A dragon! The very same I had glimpsed amidst the clouds a week ago. Yet this time, it advanced toward us, like a specter emerging from the depths of hell. That it is! No time to lose! Shouted Lyukin, mounting his horse, lens in hand. Get ready! My innate survival instinct urged me to flee this nightmarish scenario. The monster advanced, its immense body winding like a gargantuan serpent. Its head was a grotesque sculpture, the most horrible thing imaginable, and from its nostrils began to emerge a green-yellow smoke, the source of the stench of the place. Then, Lycan shouted something I didn't understand. Fall Before my eyes, a miracle unfolded. For where there was once a no rusty chen mail, a deformed face and an old straw hat, now there was a complete suit of armor, a mask even more menacing than the face it hid, all topped with an iron hat. Clad in this formidable way, like in spirit furioso and charged at the dragon vanish into the greenish cloud exhaled by the beast. The venomous mist rose and rose again, obscuring from my sight the great struggle beneath. Terrified, I swiftly found a tree large enough to hide behind, sure of the dragon's victory. To my astonishment, behind the tree I discovered Cyclop, that wretched rascal already comfortably settled, and I had to force my way to find a place of shelter. Damn cowardly donkey! Suddenly, Lyukin emerged from the green cloud, his lens broken. My sword! My sword! he shouted. From the deepest recess of my mind, I found the courage to emerge from my hiding spot to bring the sword to the knight, who without dismounting, accepted it and plunged it back into the fray. An epic battle unfolded. The dragon twisted, leaped and spewed its poison, and yet, Furiosa's agility thwarted the deadly spray each time. Lyukin sought to outmaneuver the demon equally agile, turning the skirmish into a prodigious ballad rather than a merciless struggle. Although the giant worm couldn't directly strike horse and knight, 
The oppressive cloud weighted heavily on Furioso, draining strength and making it increasingly challenging to evade the monster's attacks. Feeling his horse exhausted, Lycan turned to me once more. My raven! Quick! He shouted, dropping his sword. I understood he wanted his crow's big hammer and I left my hiding place for the second time. Yet another shining example of courage I displayed for Cyclops. At full speed, Lycan pivoted his horse and without even glancing at me seized the hammer and advanced towards the dragon in a final gambit in defiance of impending doom. Sensing the horse's fatigue, the dragon exhaled such a torrent of steam, the entire square where we stood turned green. Even Cyclope and I, as far away as we were, struggled to breathe. Furioso faltered in his charge, losing footing and collapsing to the ground. In the midst of his fall, Lyokin hurled his weapon in the direction of the dragon, uttering again the mysterious cry. Fall the hammer, mid-flight, underwent a metamorphosis, transformed into a formidable crow, a harbinger of Tempesto's vengeance. Like a powerful lightning bolt, entered the dragon's gaping mouth, emerging triumphantly from the back of its neck. The horrendous creature, mortally wounded, thrashed in all directions disgusting torrents of foul smelling secretions from its entrails. The slabs of the ground tremble beneath the agonizing monster. And it was in the midst of this unbreathable nightmare that I lost consciousness. In the ethereal realms beyond mortal perception, a celestial vision manifested. Her resplendent presence, an elven lady, an angelic apparition. Oh, my dear friend, my sweet lover, how I rejoice to find you alive! The sweet kisses of my elven lady brought me back to life. Only for me to discover that Cyclops, that cursed animal, was licking my face! <laughs> there is no creature in the world uglier, second only to the dragon. The dragon! The memory of the dragon made me jump. And I almost lost consciousness again, seeing its monstrous head just a few feet from me, before realizing that the life had left it. Seeing me awake, the impressive black knight rose and, taking a dramatic pose on the dragon's head, said to me, To your brushes, master artist, I am ready. And that was it. The setting my client was seeking. Nevertheless, after all I had seen and experienced in his company, I felt courage willing up inside me. Oh no, I said, first the treasure, my 20,000 gold coins, or there will be no portrait. Lycan laughed. Of course, master artist, your gold coins are under my feet, can't you see them? The blood of the green dragon, once properly dried, gives you the highly sought after dragon salt. It's worth 200 gold coins per pound to certain sorcerers and master chefs I know. Not to mention these green scales. Nicely polished, a king would pay a small fortune to have a breastplate made with them. So, so there's no treasure? Come now, don't make that face. I shall assist you in loading your mouth once the portrait is finished. In theory, you leave with much more than 20,000 gold pieces. In theory? I thought. No Riviera, no castle, no servants, no gold? A tear fell from my trembling eyes. 
And besides continued liking, you can take pride in being an assistant dragon slayer. Assistant dragon slayer? Those words had the power to pull me out of my sadness. Goblin royal painter and assistant dragon slayer. Now that has some prestige. With newfound enthusiasm, I set to work on the portrait of the mightiest of wandering knights, the excellent Lyokin Dragon Slayer. Once the painting was finished, we set about the revolting task of gutting the dragon to make bags from its intestines. Lyokin had a great knowledge of the beast's anatomy. The stomach was to be avoided as its contents would melt even the hardest metal in just a few minutes. We collected the monster's blood directly from its veins and ended up with several dragon blood sausages. Quite literally, their smell was foul. Then we scaled the fish, so to speak. The scales were dull and covered with a thick layer of stinking slime. I imagined the huge amount of work that would be needed to clean and polish them all. Nevertheless, these tasks, however repugnant, provided me with the opportunity to explore the strange anatomy of the dragon. And that's how I was able to document this bestial species in our dear compendium of marvels and wonders. At last, after loading our mounts as reasonably as we could, we left the haunting ruins of the Lost Sea. Sir Lyokin graciously accompanied me until we emerged from the dangerous marshes and reached the edge of the great forest. And the moment of farewell finally arrived. To my great surprise, tears of deep emotion streamed down my face. Sir Lyokin had become a true friend. A pledge was made to reunite in the future in the company of Yorel, Daggerforte and the daughters of Nanana. -Na -Na. And with that, our paths diverged. You might wonder, do I regret this adventurous escapade? Reluctantly, I say no. I felt stronger, braver, intrepid, like an assistant dragon slayer. And theoretically, quite wealthy too. Little did I know the mighty forest had yet to surrender its secrets and I would soon discover the full extent of the word theoretically. But this, dear fellow explorers, is a tale for another time. Allow me to give you a brief description of the one I named Sputa Vaporis Nazi Falsi, false nose gas spur, popularly known as the Green Dragon. The Sputa Vaporis Nazi Falsi almost exclusively inhabits the dark mangroves, extracting from its maritime swamps all the salt that gives its blood its reputation. Its extremely high salt content is essential for the dragon to produce its deadly vapors, known as green virulence. And all the strangeness of its anatomy is due to adaptations related to its characteristic spilling. The creature has, so to speak, two stomachs. The actual stomach contains large quantities of a particularly aggressive and corrosive acid. The stomach pouch is connected to a second stomach, the Saccus salis, which in turn is extremely vascularized. Its function is to filter the blood and store monstrous amounts of salt. 
The green dragon is capable of pumping the acid from its stomach into this salt pouch. From there, this mixture is propelled towards the nose by very powerful long muscles which can emit strange small sparks, even long after the creature's death. I suppose it's the combination of acid, salt and the power of these mysterious sparks that produces the noxious fumes. These sparkling muscles surround the virulent pipe, a long cartilaginous tube that ends in the tip of the nose. Moreover, the vapors do not come out, strictly speaking, through its nostrils, but rather through what I had called the gas slots. These slots, located at the end of its very long snout, are not used for breathing, but are directly connected to the virulent pipe. Its nostrils are located at the base of the ocular tower, a protrusion that places the animal's eyes well above the point of exit of the gases which could damage them. This way, the dragon avoids breathing in too much of its own venom. Everything is designed to keep the eyes and nostrils away from the point of the exit of the green virulence. Sputa Vaporis has a very flexible body, closer to that of snakes than to lizards. This characteristic, along with the small size of its wings, which are rather short compared to its size, indicates that it is more comfortable gliding between the trees of dense mangroves than making long flights at high altitude. Master of camouflage, the Sputa Vaporis nasifalsi has scales of a gleaming and reflective emerald green. It is the mud that accumulates over the years that removes its metallic sheen, thus helping to conceal the green dragon in its swampy environment. I could provide even more details about the Green Dragon, this horrible stinking monstrosity. And if you are interested, I encourage you to read the chapter dedicated to it in the appendix devoted to the dragons of our dear old Compendium of Marvels and Wonders. I hope you enjoyed this short video. If so, don't forget to leave a like, subscribe to the channel, hit the little bell to be notified when a new video is available and leave comments, suggestions or questions. Your opinion is very valuable to me. And until our paths cross once more, I extend to you wishes for a journey adorned with benevolent wonders.